Good morning all. Hello everybody. Welcome along. Hope wherever you are in the world, you and yours are safe and well. And just for the avoidance of doubt, I always like to clarify at this point that if you are a uh, logging on early for the BBC's coverage of Wimbledon or Gino De Campo's cookery spot on this morning, or maybe even the latest Joe Wicks abs and cardio session, then you're in the wrong place because this is the start of week two of the 2021 Street Games Conference. I'm Mark Clement from BBC Radio and Television, your host for the plenary session that will kick off today's activities. Now, just looking through some of the people that you've met if you have been with the conference over the space of the last week. I mean, goodness me, number of really inspiring speakers, obviously not the subject matter, deeply serious, but lots of crucial information to digest and some really inspirational young people talking about the, the power of sport and physical activity and also the work and role of street games in transforming their own lives. Our focus this week then turns to the holiday gap and just how important street games fit and fed campaign is to children, to young people and their families in disadvantaged areas and situations. And this morning we're delighted to welcome three more speakers. They're going to cover how the pandemic has affected poverty amongst children and families. We're going to cover holiday activities and food or half as most of you will know, and also the national picture regarding food. Poverty, I mean, you know, there's no doubt about it. What's happened over the last 18 months, the, the global pandemic has certainly affected the situation. Over the course of this week, we will focus around the holiday gap. We'll talk about the fundamentals of the Fit and Fed campaign, but also funding, if you're interested in that, support. We'll showcase and share the experiences of some of those who've already got involved in provision. And it would be great if you were around and available to drop in on some, most of those sessions. Once we've heard from our speakers this morning, and we're gonna stay around till around 10.30, we will take questions from you. If you'd like to participate, actually, Please get them in as our speakers are talking, obviously whilst listening to them respectfully at the same time, but we on the right hand toolbar there, we do have one, two, three. Third icon down is the chat room. So you can let us know where you are in the world, but also if you want to contribute in terms of maybe a comment off the back of one of our speakers or ask one or some of them a question, then that's where to do it. Done that, done that, done that. You're there, I'm here, speaker's in position. Let's meet the first of them. And what a great place to get us started. Who better to kick us off than the Deputy Director of the Joseph, Joseph Roundtree Foundation. She's going to talk to us about poverty amongst children and families, the situation pre-pandemic, how COVID has affected things, and the challenges going into recovery. We're delighted to welcome Helen Barnard. And I, I hope I've summed up what you're going to be talking about. There was a little bartering going on off air, Helen, about uh, subject matter between you and our two future speakers. But I hope I've summarised where you're heading in the next 15 minutes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, thank you so much, Mark. It's wonderful to be here this morning. No better way to start a, uh, start a Monday. Um, so... Uh, as Mark said, what I want to do is try and give what is the big picture context which families have been grappling with both pre-COVID and then through the pandemic and what I think might be happening as we start to move out of it. So I think the first thing is just to think about what has been happening to poverty levels, particularly among families with children in the years leading up to COVID. So you don't need to worry about most of this chart. The thing that's important is the red line, which is the level of poverty among children. And the main thing to note is just that that red line had been going up for several years leading up to 2019. So from about 2012, we were seeing more families with children being pulled into poverty. So more children starting their lives and having their formative years locked in in a situation where their families were not able to have a secure income that would cover all the bills and let them take part in society. And when we're thinking about what it means for all those children, I think it's worth saying so it, it, 
it's now up at about 30 percent, so about three in 10 children growing up in this situation. So it is a lot of our nation's children are starting life in these very difficult circumstances. And there's a quote here from one of the uh, families from a man that we were working with in London, talking about what it means to him to be in this situation with his family. And one of the most kind of uh, visible signs of this has been the soaring rates of food bank use in the years leading up to COVID and even more so through the pandemic, where what we saw was families who were already struggling were hit hardest by the economic impacts, by job losses and so on, and also actually by the health impacts. And what I think is important about this quote is it brings together the kind of two sides of what it is like living in poverty. So there is the material side of just not being able to afford the basics for your family, but there is also the emotional psychological impact. So the thing that this man was saying was that it feels degrading going to a food bank, even though they are lovely and supportive, it is just humiliating to have to go and ask strangers for food, for toilet paper, because you can't manage to survive off what you're getting, often both from work and social security. And the, uh, the, the statistic up there, the four in 10 families, that is from the very first time our government published figures of how many people who are already on social security benefits are defined as being food insecure, which means they can't afford uh, a, a decent, nutritious, enough food to for them and their families and those stats came out uh, earlier this year and it was four in ten families on universal credit which is now the main working age benefit four in ten are food insecure and of course if a family is struggling to afford food you can bet that they are also struggling to afford everything else so that same family is going to struggle to afford shoes that fit cowpole to have the heating on when they need it to have some coloring pencils to be able to fix the washing machine if it breaks. So it says, you know, the focus there is on food, but actually it affects everything. And when you work with children, you talk to children about what it means to live in poverty, the thing that is really striking is how it reaches into every aspect of a family's life and every aspect of a child's early years. So if you think about the different ways that being in this situation affects children, so you've got, first of all, the parents are, they're stressed, they're tired, they're anxious, they're lying awake at night, trying to work out if they can keep the rent up, stave off homelessness if they can, cover the bills, how they are going to manage to pay the bus fares. So you've got parents under this immense amount of pressure, as well as trying to keep family life and work going. You've also often got strange relationships. So the leading cause of arguments between couples is money worries and debt. And you also see a lot more arguments between children and parents when the family is in this incredibly pressured situation. And of course, children, you know, children are smart. They know what is going on. So you also often have children are really actively worried about whether they as a family are going to be able to keep everything going, whether they're going to keep their home, whether they're going to be able to afford the basics. And children often talk about the feeling of shame that they feel when they know that they and their family can't afford the everyday things that their friends and peers can. You've also got the way that poverty restricts what you can do socially with a kind of being part of things. So maybe the football club is free, but you have to pay the bus fare to get there and that puts it out of your reach. And of course, if your family is struggling for every penny to pay the essential bills, being able to afford something like a family day out can feel way outside what you can imagine. And those kind of moments of family life, of joy, where you can just forget about everything and enjoy being together, it's much harder to make those happen when life is a daily struggle just to keep the basics going. You also see with children who are growing up in poverty, they're much more likely to be in homes which are insecure, which are damp, which are expensive, which are not kind of warm, welcoming places that feel safe for you when you're growing up. And we've seen a lot through the pandemic, the effect of people who are stuck in this overcrowded, damp housing, where you can't really self-isolate, where you haven't got outside space, where you can see things like asthma problems getting worse because children are spending all their time in a damp house. And of course, services, what you quite often find children in this situation also struggle to access good quality services of all kinds. 
not going to say much about this, but I think probably the people on the call, this will feel quite familiar. Certain kinds of families are much more likely to get stuck in this situation. So when you've got young parents, lone parent families, parent, families with young children, families with any more than two children, uh, many families from ethnic minority groups are more likely to face this issue. And families, if you've got an adult or a child who is disabled, you are much more likely to be living in poverty. Now, if you think about what are the drivers, what is it that traps people? And what you see is families who are hemmed in all around by these barriers. So what we see now, most families in poverty have at least one person in work. Quite a lot of them now have two people in work. But the jobs that people are getting, they're low paid. They're also though often insecure. So parents don't know what shifts they're working from one week to the next. They pay for transport and childcare. They turn up. The shift's been cancelled. They're out of pocket. And they also don't, you know, that they were relying on that money to pay the bills that week. So getting stuck in that kind of work is a real problem for people. And it's really hard to get out once you're there. High housing costs is a big issue. So people who are stuck in private rented homes, particularly, which are expensive. The fact that social security has been weakened in the last decade with various cuts and freezes, meaning that it's not the strong lifeline that people need to be able to rely on. And seeing the rising cost of living, we're starting to see inflation kick back in now for families who are already on a knife edge of whether they can cover their costs. A small rise in the cost of living can be the thing that tips you over into not being able to afford things you need. So what's the answer? So I'm going to go through kind of the big picture things that we need to change as a society and the things that we can then also be doing as individuals. So the first thing is social security is absolutely the lifeline people need to keep them going when times are tough. We've seen millions of people turn to it during COVID, but of course for families in poverty, even when there isn't a big national crisis going on, there are very often crises happening in your personal life that mean you need to be able to turn to social security. And one really important thing is actually making sure people are getting what they're entitled to. Sounds very simple, but a lot of people don't. So actually having services in GP services or youth or community centres, places that people go where they can do a check to make sure that you're actually getting everything you should be getting. Also, affordable credit can be something that can really help some families. So when families are falling behind with the bills, they're trying to stitch together your wages, your social security, quite often families also pay on debt to try and keep up with the bills and the rent. And if that debt is expensive and not tailored towards being affordable, that can make things even worse. Second thing is housing. So we need a lot more really affordable local homes, especially we need to build social homes. And that's something that actually local authorities have a lot of power over. So that's something that as citizens of our local authority, it is really worth talking to MPs and local authorities to say we need more low cost homes. We want social housing in our area because it will free families from being in poor quality housing and from having all of their food budget taken up by the rent. And of course, work. So for, you know, we see more and more parents getting into work, but being stuck in these jobs which are not paying enough and not giving them enough hours are not secure enough to give you a decent basis for your life. So we need to improve, we need to increase the number of decently paid jobs, so getting more employers to pay the real living wage, but we also need a lot more job security. So what we saw in the pandemic was that people who were on insecure contracts, who were agency workers or were uh, would do it in the gig economy, were much more likely to lose their jobs than people doing exactly the same job for the same pay, but on a permanent contract. So actually shifting people on to contracts which give them a bit of job security is vital. Opening up better paid, better quality part-time work for all the parents and carers who want to combine work and care often get stuck in these low paid jobs because better paid jobs aren't advertised as being open flexible work. That can make a massive difference. And having the kind of infrastructure that make, enables people to get jobs and keep jobs. So things like childcare affordable, accessible, quality childcare and getting the buses right. You know, for particularly outside London, having a bus service that's affordable and that you can rely on 
can really make the difference between being able to get into a better paid job that's maybe a couple of buses away or being stuck with a much worse job but you can walk to it so it's more reliable. And then finally, and this is something that Greta and then Andrew, I think, will talk a lot more in a lot more detail about. For children who are stuck in that in this situation of growing up in poverty, we need to change the barriers that keep them there, but we also need to support them to flourish, whatever is happening around them, in a sense. So supporting family life, supporting those relationships, which even if you're in a really hard situation, can make all the difference to your daily life. Having accessible, high quality, affordable childcare locally can be transformative for the whole family, but especially obviously for a child and for their prospects and making sure that all children get a really good education. So that is about the basics of having good school leaders, good teaching, but also what they call poverty proofing the school day. And there's a brilliant organisation called uh, Children North East who have started this. And what they've done is work with children who are on low incomes looking at the school day through their eyes and showing all the ways that as you go through your school day having enough money can make a difference now it should be a child walks in the school gate and it makes no difference what their family situation is but that's not the case for too many children so there are some great resources out there for schools where they can change how they do things to make sure that children feel equally included regardless of their family background or their income so that is something which every school can do and it can just really change how a child experiences education. And just finally, I just wanna end on this, that for me, one of the most important things is that we work with the people who are most expert about poverty and that is people who live it daily. Nobody knows more about what it's like to live in poverty or what will change your life than the people who are dealing with it every single day. And one of the things that I really want to see change in national policy making and local policy making, but also in all the organisations that work with these families, is to actually define it with people so that their voice is driving what the services look like and how it's delivered, because it will be so much more effective if we have all the experts in the room. And that should start with the people who are expert because they've lived it all their lives. I'm going to stop now and hand back to Mark, uh, but look forward to seeing your comments and any questions. Thanks very much, Mark. Helen, thank you. I mean, just from me, I mean, that phrase is ghastly, isn't it? Food insecure. I mean, it, it, it just, it, it, and I was actually, as you were talking, I was just looking up the psychologist Abraham Maslow's higher, uh, scales of hierarchy in the 1950s. It's been updated since, but, you know, that we have physiological needs, then safety needs, they're our basics. And then we can't really progress to the sort of belongingness we all need or the esteem needs we have until we've got the base in place, let alone get on to the next stage, which is self-actualization, to be who we might be able to be. I mean, well, I'm, I'm saying this because it, it just undermines us as human beings, doesn't it, that, that you can't even get off the first step of what our expectations would be in life. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think it's very closely linked to that need for safety. So the thing that I've been hearing most from people uh, when we've talked to people this year and, and previously has been the sense of constant insecurity you have when you're in poverty, that you can never be sure you will have, you'll be able to cover your bills, you'll be able to keep a roof over your head. And, you know, not having enough food is one aspect of that, and it's appalling, but it's always worth remembering that it's not just food, it's everything else you need. And so that's why kind of the solution to food insecurity isn't to give people food, it's to create a situation where they have enough income to afford the essentials for themselves with dignity, because, that, you know, that's what people want. And so it's kind of saying, you know, we shouldn't just be giving out food parcels we should be making sure that we have a social security system that gives you that security, that we have well-paid, you know, decent jobs, that you're not having to cut back on food to pay the rent. Because often the food budget is the only flexible bit of your budget when you're in poverty. It's the only thing you can cut back on because you've already cut back on everything else. And if you want to keep the rent going and you want to not get cut off, then, you know, food is the thing that goes. So parents will skip meals as one of the first kind of things they do to try and manage being on a low income 
but you're right it's appalling you know it's just unacceptable isn't it it's not how we want any of our families any of our children to grow up and yet we've got four in ten families who are getting benefits that are supposed to prevent this you know it really is it really unacceptable yeah just up against it from the very start helen thanks for a sobering start to the day i'll see you in about half an hour's time just looking through some of your comments in the chat room great to have you all telling us where you are and i'm loving the weather reports as well jane in liverpool tells us it's cloudy hannah hannah gray in london uh, is your name really hannah hannah or did you not know which column to fill in your forename and which column to fill in your surname hannah hannah uh stacy in rotherham where it's also cloudy cloudy in kafili as well with rachel drizzly in reading the ceo of street games mark lorry claire lane is in a wet and windy bristol I'll get some more in a little bit later. We're all here for serious reasons, but it's nice to know where you are in the world and what's going on out of your windows. Next up, let's head to Northumbria University, or rather, we'll meet the director of the Healthy Living Lab at Northumbria University. Delighted to say good morning, Professor Greta de Beta. Um, that was a sobering start to the day for us, I'm afraid to say, Greta, wasn't it? Where are we heading next with you? Yeah, so first of all, Helen's exactly right around the structural issues around poverty. Um, I'm going to pick up on Helen's talk and talk specifically about holiday activities and food. So what the programme is and what the impacts on not only children, but parents are of attending the programme. Thanks, Greta. I'll leave it to you. OK. Right. I may be preaching to the converted here, but I just wanted to include this first slide just so everybody's on the same page and up to speed in terms of holiday activities and food that everybody is shortening and just using the acronym HAP. So as many of you already know, it's a program of activities um, and food for children and sometimes parents as well from underserved communities across the school holidays. And it was funded by the Department for Education and Andrew's going to pick up about the history of the funding. But the funding for this year rose significantly up to 220 million pounds. And we're hoping that this funding will be extended for subsequent years because it's a fantastic program. And I put the link on there for anybody that's interested. Um, I think in terms of the program, I think it's just important to point here. There are some pictures of food here, but there's also a picture of a physical activity and a, a picture of an art activity. And there's a picture of me actually attending a holiday club up there in the top left hand corner. So I do go out and see what's happening and try to get a real sense of what the provision is like and also what children and parents are saying about the provision. So. Last year, I published a paper with um, a friend and colleague from the Mayor's Fund for London, Kitchen Social, that run a half um, advisory service for London boroughs to deliver this programme. And we looked at the uh, interviewing key stakeholders and also holiday club leaders or uh, hub, uh, club leaders about the need for half. Why was half needed? And so obviously picking up on Helen's theme, we, uh, the first priority was around financial hardship. So the uh, families suffering from financial hardship and just generally struggling parents, parents struggling to actually um, afford and find childcare provision. It's fine saying that actually parents can't afford it, but actually the market of childcare provision isn't actually um, flexible enough to actually during the summer holidays meet the increased demand of childcare. We looked at social isolation, both for parents and for their children. The decrease in physical activity that's well documented in the scientific literature for children across the summer holidays. Food insecurity, I'll be presenting some data on that as well. And also the sense of place, the sense of actually having a community. And when the schools are closed, the issue in many communities is that you find parents isolated because there's no sense of place. To, um, lack of funding over the last few years in terms of community resources means often there's no place to go and hang out. And I'll give you one quick example of this. So a few years ago, I was in London and I was at a big webinar with lots of young people. And the young people were telling me that they went to the fried chicken shop. And I said, why do you go to the fried chicken shop during the holidays? 
And their answer really astounded me because I thought they were going to say, well, we like the food. And I was thinking about, you know, what dietary analysis can I do here? And what they actually said is, Greta, it's cheap, it's warm, and it's a safe place to hang out. And every day, I was down in London for a week, and every day I walked past this chicken shop, and it was just full of young people because they had nowhere else to go. So this is from a study that was conducted in the Northeast. It was actually um, partnered with Children Northeast. I'm in Newcastle and children obviously just around the corner from where I work. We wanted to look at holiday club attendance from children, but we wanted to look at the well-being of the parents. So often the research focuses on the impact on the young children or the youth attending the club. But we wanted to see was there a benefit for the parents? And if it was, what was driving that benefit? What was the essential key ingredient, if you like, for holiday um, club attendance that was needed to improve? parental well-being. So we looked at four main issues and we sent this parent um, questionnaire out to 133 parents. So it included expanding access to food, reducing social isolation, building relationships, promoting improved child behaviour and structure, promoting childhood activities and engagement. And we compared all four of those to our outcome measure, which in this case was parental well-being and we used the Warwick Edinburgh assessment scale so these are all validated scales that we're using here and what we found this is a picture of one of the parents that um, filled our survey and then spoke to us about it is that we found increased parental well-being between last summer so a summer when their children didn't attend a club compared to the current summer when their children were attending the club improved so just sending their children to holiday club and the holiday club for this particular um, program was over four weeks, improved their well-being. It reduced reducing social isolation and building relationships is the key factor and is associated with higher levels of well-being. So it's important when we're thinking of these um, programs to think about how we support the parents as well. Happy, well-supported parents results in happy, flourishing and well-supported children. And what was quite interesting is that we found parents from ethnically diverse communities were more likely to report higher levels of uh, parental well-being after their ch children attended the club. So this was particularly important. And we think that's probably correlated with the lack of services in these particular communities. So I'm going to switch now to looking at constantly coping to put food on the table. So now I'm talking about food insecurity. This paper was just published this year and it was quite an extensive study um, and it was quite surprising to us because we entered this study thinking that during the school term, families were actually quite well supported in terms of food security by the free school meal service. But that proved not to be the case. So I'll quickly run you through it. So pre-holiday, so this is when children are still in school before they're broken up for the summer holiday in this case. And the context that parents reported was budget is tight, they're constantly budgeting, constantly planning on their food and how to shop, borrowing money from families and friends, often trying to skip bills and working out if they're behind on one bill, they're paying the bill next month and then going behind another bill. So, so tons of cognitive load and coping strategies or trying to cope strategies in terms of this context. What they were also doing is they were trying to save and provision food coming up to the summer holiday because they knew that this would be a particularly challenging time. So clear budgeting skills here, but very little flex and very little room to budget on. They started to cut back prior to the summer holiday. And you can see some quotes here. And probably the best one I, I really like. I like to go to the up section. I honestly didn't know what the up section was. It's the upsy food that's in, I think it's in Asda and then chuck it in the freezer. Then we eat that, you know, when we're short of money, we eat out of the freezers during the summer holiday. So then we looked at the summer holidays without half provision. And again, you see similar things. The budget's tight. They have to provide this one extra meal a day. They don't, the children aren't receiving their free school dinner at school. The children are home all day. There's not enough money to go out. They're bored. They're constantly snacking. And this comes up time and time again, this notion of, constantly snacking, they're inactive, there's less physical activity, they're not doing physical activity at school, parents can't afford to go out and uh, go to sports clubs and swimming and all, all the physical activity um, that we take for granted. 
And also from the social side of it, they didn't invite friends around. And the reason they didn't invite friends around is there simply wasn't enough food to share. Shopping bills increase, food as priorities. They buy more foods and snacks. Some are healthy, but the majority aren't. Small shopping, typically uh, topping up locally, downgrade brands, online shopping became a particular feature, especially during the pandemic. And one of the reasons for that is that families didn't face the stigma of removing things from their um, shopping basket if they couldn't have enough money to pay the bill. And bargain hunting. These people, uh, when I speak to people that are um, in poverty, they are fantastic. They know where all the bargains are in terms of food um, and they work really hard at it. And as a consequence of this, you get, I don't like this term particularly, but you get what we call holiday hunger. And holiday hunger we've defined as just food insecurity across the summer period. But there's also the lack of physical activity, their dietary intake is compromised and the social isolation. Not only is there the issue of the stigma around food insecurity, but there's tons of evidence, and I've just published a systematic review on this, that food insecurity has long lasting physical and cognitive psychological effects on children. So you can see things such as increased depression, anxiety, stunting of growth, problems with dental caries. Um, you could go on and on, um, diabetes, cancer. It, it's, it's really, really shocking. We must do something about this. And you can see here some of the quotes from the people that are involved in this. And moving on, when, I, when we looked at holiday activities with her, you have the same context, um, but you often find that, um, let's um, be honest, when we're looking at holiday provision across this period of time, it was initially rather patchy, but this is an area where they had good holiday provision. You can see that clubs tend to be located in areas of high deprivation, access, children have access to nutritious food and enriching activities, parents access support and advice, and this picks up on what Helen was saying about advice around benefits, but also advice around other things and social networks have formed. The benefits of have provision is that it extends beyond food, it alleviates food insecurity. It doesn't eliminate it, but it does alleviate food insecurity. It reduces social isolation for parents and children. It increases physical and mental well-being in both parents and children. And we have the advisory services for parents. Perhaps most important as well at the end here is it helps to build resilient communities. Now, we will now just to talk about, for some reason, my um, title isn't showing there, but what I'm going to talk about is dietary intake. So we all know through half provision that food should, um, um, apply, the food that is served has to um, align with school food standards. However, there's a difference between the food that's served and the food that children eat. And so this study here particularly looked at the food that children eat. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here because I, I know I run out of time and I can speak forever. But on the left hand side, we have a graph that looks at diet quality. So when you look at school food standards, there's a range of uh, nutritional or dietary standards around the food that should be served at holiday club. And what uh, one of my PhD students has done this year is we have managed to collapse the whole dietary menu into one single score for a child. So we are able to quickly compare whether children are meeting those standards in terms of their dietary intake. And with the diet quality uh, score, we include things like fruit, vegetables, uh, fat, carbohydrate, protein, intrinsic sugars. It, it's quite complicated, but it makes it easier for um, especially people that are providing this activity to get one score. And you can see quite clearly there there's a significant difference between attending and non-attending. And that's important because we, in addition to reducing or alleviating food insecurity, we want to make sure that the food that the children are eating is nutritious food. And you can see quite clearly that the um, nutritional content is better. And on the right hand side, there's a bit of a breakdown. This is one snapshot of the constituents of the diet quality score. And you can see that every factor apart from dairy, they were either the same or improved on the day attending. So if you look at fat in particular, whilst it looks like it's 
a higher increase in fat, it's not. The higher the score, the better in this case, okay? So it's not saying that they have more fat. What that score on the right-hand side is saying, that graph is saying, is that the closer they are to the score of 11, the better their profile against that particular macro or micronutrient. And when we look at, there's other ways of cutting the data on this. So on this particular graph, we looked at the percentage of children meeting each school food standard requirement as a factor of attendance. So we just didn't look at school food standards overall. We broke it down into its constituents parts. And you can see here on many of the things that you're looking at. So if you look at, for example, the second column in fruit and vegetables, 31% of children on a day attending reached a total score of two, which means that they're eating five or more fruits and vegetables a day, compared to only 1.8% on a day when the same children are not attending. So these are the same children measured on a day attending and a day are not attending. And the importance of doing that is that you control for individual differences such as lack of fruit and vegetables. And it's really clear to see there, apart from healthier drinks on the end, which is not significant, but it is slightly lower on an attending day. That overall performance in terms of the percentage of children meeting the school standards is far better. I think the fruit and vegetable one stands out a, a, a complete mile to me. So in summary, HAP makes a difference to the lives of thousands of children, their families and communities. And it's through the good work of organisations like Street Games that children and their families benefit from HAP provision. There's clear evidence of increased physical activity, Improved dietary intakes and not just improvement in terms of the food served, but the actual food that children are eating. Peru improved mental well-being for parents and children, a reduction or alleviation in food insecurity. Clear evidence of helping to rebuild and have resilient communities. Other factors that I haven't talked about today are school readiness. We've got quite a lot of evidence now coming in that it helps children in terms of going back to school, they have something fun to say about what they did during the holidays. It helps with a levelling up agenda in terms of the educational attainment gap. Increased social interaction. And my goodness, we need this now more than ever. And there's a real strong evidence base for the extension of that. And probably someone that would say it better than me is this guy right here. You may recognise him. Um, he's done a real lot of good work in terms of campaigning for HAP and food and also in terms of poverty for children and their families. And finally, I'd just like to thank all of the local authorities and everybody that's helped us in making um, our research live and being able to support HAP going forward. Thank you very much. Greta, I mean, you're right. That fruit and veg statistic is, is frightening, isn't it? But I, I can't help but think of the vicious circle where, you know, we all know you can go to your local market and buy you can fill your, your, your sort of veg box probably for six, seven quids with red peppers and courgettes. But of course, if parents are feeling stressed and strained and also, I don't know, the, the periphery purchases like seasoning to spark that stuff, to spark veg up is not edible straight away. You know, you'd spread it over a few weeks. It becomes a vicious circle there, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think it's, I think that one of the things that I'd say here is that I often hear people saying you can go and, you know, somebody said to me the other day, you can go and buy a bowl of red peppers for a pound. Yeah. Well, you can in London, but you can't in Newcastle. Ah. And so, so it, what we always do is we always take London as kind of like, this is what the picture looks like. And it's really important when we're looking at something across at least England in terms of half, that we look at different ge geographies. So we look at what fruit and vegetable provision is like in the northeast, the northwest, in Birmingham, in more rural areas. It's not it's not always the same. So for, I'll give you an example. I live in a very poor working class town in the northeast of England. I've lived here for 17 years. I have no intention of moving out of it. I went to my local market the other day and to buy four mixed peppers was one pound ninety six. Wow. That's that, and that's four small mixed peppers. No, so that's a very different picture. We also have to bear in mind that it's not just about the skills of, of cooking and being able to provide um, food for children. 
It's also we have to look at the structure and the context in the environment in which people are living. If you're living in a house of multiple occupancy, where you may have a shared kitchen, where do you store the food? If you don't have access in a bed sitter bed set to a cooker, how do you cook the vegetables? So people, it's very, very complex. Part of it is about education, but part of it is looking wider at the food system as well to make sure we have equity in provision of food, an end of food deserts where I live. It's a complete food desert. My high street has two fried chicken shops and a pizza shop. That's it in the high street. Everything else is, you know, bright house, betting shop, a pub that's closed down. Um, we have a pound land and a pound world that's closed down. That's, they're the only shops in my high street. And so I think it's really important as we move forward is that we look at this through multiple eyes. This isn't just an individual level. We have to provide a food system and a consumer system where we don't, people aren't having to make these choices because all of our food that's there is healthy. Greta, I'll tell you what, I'll see you in about 15 minutes time and we'll take some questions. I can't think of a better man who can give us that national perspective on the food situation than the CEO of Feeding Britain. Andrew Forsey is going to say a few words to us now. I mean, I kind of, that shocked me as well, Andrew, that discrepancy between communities. I mean, you know, I suppose I always associate London with being very expensive in many respects for for certainly eating out for food and stuff like that. But but of course it is a sort of epicenter of plentiful supply which emanates out if you're in the right place market wise to cheap food as well, but not necessarily, as Greta's just said, to get it off to the extremities of the country. Certainly, Mark. And I was fortunate enough last year to work with Greta and her team of researchers in Northumbria on a survey to look at the different coping strategies that households had deployed throughout the first lockdown last spring. And it was those families who were at the sharp end of the social and economic consequences of the pandemic who were in fact the most likely to plan their week's meals ahead of time. Uh, to buy ingredients and cook meals from scratch and to waste less food. Despite all of those coping strategies, they were still struggling like mad to put food on the table from one week to the next. And that was even after additional coping strategies, like sadly having to rely on a food bank or borrowing money from friends, borrowing food from friends had been used up as well. So it really hints at those broader structural drivers uh, to which Helen referred but also some of these community self-help schemes, as I would characterise half, that Greta has been describing. Um, I suppose looking ahead to the summer, aside from Paul in sunny Warrington, it might seem rather crazy on a cold, grey, drizzly Monday morning like today to be talking about the imminent arrival of the mega summer holiday activities and food programme. But as all too many of us are aware, it is only a few weeks away now. And as I'll be touching upon in the next few minutes, it does represent a potentially landmark moment for the development of social policy for children and families across England. The advantage I've had, Mark, of listening to Helen and of having worked with Greta on this topic for some time is that I can summarise my remarks by saying simply that I agree totally with what both of you have said and that our experience at Feeding Britain of what too many children and families have had to grapple with during school holidays particularly with the six week summer break, really does hammer home one seemingly obvious, but nonetheless key point. And that is an effective strategy for eliminating child poverty, for raising family living standards, and for equalizing children's life chances, it needs to cover both the provision of an adequate household income through the labor market and the social security system, and also the necessary investment in effective services and community assets upon which so many of us rely and particularly those of us on the lowest incomes and it, in my mind mark if there's one lesson that still holds true from the blair and brown era it's that cash plus services thread must run right the way through such a strategy now looking specifically at holiday provision feeding britain's involvement and interest began eight years ago that was when the cross-party group of MPs and peers who created the charity 
were searching the country for answers as to why even back then there had been such a rapid growth in the numbers of people struggling to access and afford food and this accompanying growth in a need for food banks. But most importantly, what could be done to put that growth and these alarming trends into reverse? And I had the privilege of serving as the group secretary at that time. And I'll never forget the shiver that went down my spine when one food bank in the northwest of England showed me a graph on which they had plotted their monthly breakdown of the past year's referrals. And looking down at that graph, I was just struck, awestruck, by this Everest-like peak in demand from the numbers of families of children being referred to the food bank during each of the longer school holidays and particularly the six-week summer break. It's worth remembering that it's one thing to look at a graph and see numbers and trends and data, but each of those referrals represents a household that's hungry with no money to buy food. As Helen said, probably no money to pay the bills or the rent either, and therefore that family almost certainly being destitute. Soon after looking at those Everest-like peaks from the food bank in Merseyside, as to what happened in the holidays, similarly worrying evidence became when well, it was flooding in from other food banks across the country. And those trends and those graphs were accompanied, accompanied by comments such as, and I quote, I've spoken to a few mums whose weekly shop during the school holidays is three times what it usually is. We see families facing the daunting prospects of six weeks without being able to feed their children. And from elsewhere, we saw a 45% increase in families between June and July due to the loss of the one wholesome meal a day which the free school meal provides. And so with Feeding Britain's creation at the conclusion of that inquiry and the development of our first regional pilot projects, the provision of food and fun for children and families during the holidays to help them avoid being hungry or need to rely on food banks became an early priority of ours. Our first programme began to be implemented through the Feeding Birkenhead programme in Merseyside and our job was to ensure that through libraries, through playgrounds, through churches, through children's centres and other community assets, a coherent, stigma-free, high-quality programme of decent meals and fun activities was available for all families across the town. Early feedback at the conclusion of that first pilot programme from the local food bank suggested that the programme had successfully reversed the increased emergency need from families during the holidays. But moreover, families were saving much needed money each week to keep on top of their bills. And the programme began to demonstrate a number of favourable consequences for children's development. It had resulted in the bonds and relationships both between and within families becoming stronger. Teachers commented on children's improved preparedness for school, that there were lower levels of anxiety among families, and children were learning new skills and benefiting from new experiences that they could now share with their mates upon returning to school, all as a result of the activities and the range of food on offer through the programme. I remember at one particular project in Tranmere, when offered the choice of two tables, one containing a selection of cakes and biscuits, or the other containing a wide selection of fresh fruits, the children ran as one towards the latter, towards the fresh fruits. So rare had this source of goodness been in the absence of the programme. Reduced isolation and loneliness amongst parents was another advantage. There was that stronger sense of connectedness to and with their community. And for some parents, the programme offered a source of childcare, which enabled them to take on extra shifts at work and earn more money. Now, two years on from that first pilot, as the Feeding Britain network grew to 12 regions, this programme came to support tens of thousands of children and their families across the country. And yet still there was no acknowledgement at the time from government of the policy gap covering the holidays and the effects of that gap, the holiday gap, the hunger gap, on children's immediate quality of life and their future life chances. We knew therefore, both as a charity and being linked with that cross-party group of MPs and peers, that our next job had to involve presenting to ministers compelling evidence on the true extent and severity of need during the holidays, as well as the impact this was having on educational and health inequalities amongst children, and also for the potential for relatively small sums of taxpayers' money to make a sizable difference on those fronts, 
and crucially the cross-party involvement in the development of this argument. Not an easy task as you can imagine, but one we approached by making two moves. First, we ran a short, focused parliamentary inquiry with that original cross-party group of founding trustees, which covered all the evidence and good practice emerging from the grassroots around holiday provision, and then using that to draft backbench legislation, which would apply the evidence through the delivery of a national programme with significant investment from the taxpayer. I wouldn't be surprised if lots of you in attendance this morning, certainly Greta and Street Games Fit and Fed, either contributed evidence and good practice to that inquiry or had published reports containing such information, which I remember only too well when drafting the inquiry's report, played such a crucial role in shaping our proposals and in turn guiding the specific proposals within that backbench bill that came to Parliament. Now, with Feeding Britain founding trustees in the House of Commons agreeing to sponsor the bill, we went on to gain support from more than 100 MPs from all sides of the House. And I remember when we presented this bill to the Minister, and after a brief discussion on the merits and coverage of existing programmes, as well as crucially the need for a national programme, the Minister ran his finger down this lengthy list of MPs we'd compiled behind the bill, and he looked up and he said, well, we'd better set up a programme for the school holidays. And so that was where the holiday activities and food programme of pilots and research to help inform future policy around school holiday provision was created. An initial sum of two million pounds was made available for the 2018 summer holiday with the promise of an additional nine million pounds for 2019. And as we all know, that would end up being extended with a further nine million pounds in 2020 and now into the national programme we're privileged to be supporting this year. Now, looking ahead, I think there are three key things to be pursued so that the cash plus services approach can reap dividends for children and their families. Two of those things currently exist and will need to be fought for if they're to be extended beyond this year. Firstly, there's the £20 increase in the standard allowance for universal credit that was introduced last year at the beginning of the pandemic and which, as things stand, is due to be cut later this year in the autumn. And if it is cut, that will expose hundreds of thousands of children to poverty or plunge them deeper into poverty. That cut must be fought successfully. And second, it's only by delivering an effective service this summer and demonstrating that effectiveness to MPs on the government benches that I think we'll be able to convince the Treasury of the need to embed the holiday activities and food programme on a secure, longer term footing within the welfare state with a view to it becoming a mainstream taxpayer funded service delivered through trusted community settings for supporting children and families during every school holiday. And there's a third thing that does not yet exist, but which is the aim of a bill that one of our supporters in Parliament has just tabled. And that is to peg for the first time the annual rates of tax credits and benefits to the actual costs of food and other essentials that reflect the minimum standard of living which safeguards all of our fellow citizens from poverty. No government since the war has made a serious effort to draw that direct link between that minimum standard and the actual scale rates. And so such an effort in our view is long overdue. And with that, I'll conclude if I may, by both thanking so many of you in attendance who through your excellent past and ongoing practice and the use of community assets during the holidays have given us the evidence we needed to both secure and then shape what has become the holiday activities and food programme, and also by re-emphasising the importance of that cash plus services approach. If our welfare state is to stand any chance of eliminating poverty and destitution, providing a greater number of opportunities for all children to access decent food and enriching activities in the holidays, and in doing so to tackle head on some of those inequalities in children's life chances, then that continued raising of household incomes at the bottom will need to go hand in hand with firm investment in proven programmes like the Holiday Activities and Food Scheme for many years to come. 
Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Just while Greta and Helen are maybe switching their cameras back on, let me just read you a few of the responses from some of you that we've had. I mean, uh, this is bringing together the sort of composite of what you've all been discussing. Stacey Lynn, good morning. Such an important topic and everyone can play a part, spot families and young people with this. Uh, Lisa Graham says also when parents are stressed trying to make ends meet, they haven't always got the headspace to plan a budget meals. Matthew Daly says it's incredibly complex, not always about skills either. Sometimes it's time and it's easy to, to easier to stick things in the oven or microwave for 30 minutes than to prep for 30 and then cook for another 60. And I know you, uh, Greta, you and and Matthew have actually been going backwards and, and forwards a little bit in the chat room on this subject. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a really evocative subject, isn't it? This, this sort of balance between ingredients and the money to buy the ingredients, but also the stressed individuals trying to look after their children, feeling fairly degraded, as Helen has said, but still having to try and find the effort to, to leave the, the box of convenience. Greta, that one was to you to start us off, please. Okay. So I think it's really important here when we look at, um, we have to look at the food system and Henry Dimbleby is doing some great work on the national food strategy to look at the whole system supply chain and what food is available in communities. If you actually look, so let's just take a step back from poverty for a second. If we look at increasing uh, rates of obesity over the last few years, it's no surprise that when supermarket shopping, convenience and ultra processed foods became readily available, so did the increase in obesity start. That's, there's, there's, there's clear evidence of that. And so I think that what we have to do is we have to look at a systems wide approach that we make affordable, healthy, nutritious food available to all, we actually look at our whole systems in enabling and supporting families to have the time to do that. And, and that's important because, as Helen said, if you're, if you're stressed or if you're working two jobs, I know some families that are working two part-time jobs to try and cope, and, you know, that parents are like passing ships in the night, to put it bluntly. There's no way within that current system. However, you have access to affordable, nutritious food, will you be able to support and have the time to cook and prepare the food? And so when I think we're looking at food, what tends to happen is that everyone takes food out of the equation of our national system or in terms of poverty. Food and food insecurity is part of poverty. And, and people keep taking it, it's not a separate issue. The different skill set, yes, we have a generation of young people where home ed wasn't taught, taught in schools, but that was everybody. That just was, you know, the, the teacher didn't say, oh, guys, you guys are in poverty, we won't teach you about it, and you guys are from better off families and we'll teach you about it. Everybody had that. And so I think that focusing on the individual is not the right way to go forward. If we have the systems in place, it's far easier for individuals to change their behavior because the system is supporting that behavior change. The idea that we're going to teach everybody to cook and suddenly everyone's going to rush off and do great, you know, make kind of sourdough bread and everything just isn't going to happen. So does that make sense? So I'll give you one example. Marcus Rashford has recently started up cooking for children, right? Now Marcus quite openly comes out and says that he grew up in a very poor background and he had his mum was had difficulty coping and he went to breakfast clubs and he you know used um, sports as a way of um, gaining coming out of poverty. Okay. Now I think it's fair to say that Marcus now does not live in poverty, but Marcus openly says he can't cook. And so we have to look at helping people to cook affordable meals but also making sure that they have the space and the time and the money to be able to do that. And that's why the system is complex. We can't just blame the individual that you can't cook and that's why you're not feeding your, your family well. It's, as, as people in the chat said, it's far more complicated than that. But we, it's not just the, the food poverty. When we look at something like holiday activity, it's physical activity, it's social isolation, it's childcare, it's 
All of these things work together. They, they shouldn't be isolated. And one thing I would say, if you're looking at theories to actually look at this, rather than use Maslow's, if you use Bronfenner's social e ecological model, that's the kind of model that we should be looking at. So we're looking at all of these policy, how policy benefits the welfare state, how these all interact together, because people aren't just people that eat, they do lots of other things as well. And we have to, people are complex, systems are complex. And that, that would be my approach to that. Andrew Fawcy, I know you've got to go very, very soon. Just before you do, I, I, I mean, Greta's mentioned Marcus Rashford a couple of times. I just wonder how important it is to have that very visible figurehead continuously banging the drum and also clearly able to get the ear of significant government ministers to drive this. But I guess the question is, how do we keep the momentum going so there's no slip back on this? How does this become a movement that dovetails into the work of street games and the half programme and really starts, those wheels start to turn very, very quickly? I think three things, Mark, two of which relate to Marcus's ongoing role. Um, firstly, he's such an important person for the public to get behind because here is a, an unbelievably successful young man but who's never forgotten his roots. He's still attached to his roots and he's driven by that upbringing. So when he speaks on these issues, he does so with the utmost credibility and passion and emotion that people can get behind. But secondly, again linked to Marcus, they now know within 10 Downing Street that whenever they're announcing a, a policy or change of policy, when it comes to child poverty and children's life chances, that Marcus will be picking up the phone to them to let them know what he thinks, uh, which is, I think unbelievably important as an asset for those of us trying to drive through changes in poverty policy. But thirdly, for what those of us within the Street Games Fit and Fed networks, within the Feeding Britain Holiday Club networks and beyond, I think really need to do now is we've been given a chance with this sizable investment, investment of taxpayers' money to show that we've got a program here that works, is popular and is effective, can be delivered at scale, and needs to be delivered at scale, both as a means of improving children's immediate quality of life, but in doing so, adding massively to their future life chances. So I think there's a duty on all of us in what four weeks time now, as the six week holiday begins, to show that we can be trusted to deliver this mainstream public service, as I hope it will be viewed in years to come. And in doing so, we'll be strengthening the resilience in communities, as Greta has said, and in doing so, give many hundreds of thousands if not millions of children a leg up mm. and i wonder as well helen you you talked about the, the sort of degrading aspect of using a, a food bank i wonder whether to have a figurehead that that is clearly known to so many people sharing so vividly their stories of the the sort of seven yogurts bought for a week and if you ate two on the monday you were going to miss out on one for one of the days that alignment does that does that help morale and make people not feel quite so degraded to find themselves in that on that bottom step that we discussed earlier um so I think obviously Marcus Rashford has has played a tremendous role and I think as you said it's the the combination of being able to speak about his own experience but also one of the things that he has done I think from the beginning is he has spent a lot of time talking with families who are currently in that position so what he says is very much rooted in real experiences. From the point of view of families who are trapped there I mean I I don't know. I would be surprised if on a day to day level it makes you feel different because you can still see that, you know, you can't live the way everyone else can live. The only thing that I, I'm always slightly nervous about is I think the kind of engagement we get around food poverty as a concept, because it's really kind of easy to connect with. So I completely get that. It makes me nervous, though, because if you describe it as food poverty, it implies the answer is food. Whereas I think obviously Greta has said, I've said, I think everybody knows the leading cause of food poverty is nothing to do with food. It's to do with money. So I kind of think we need to find a way to use Rashford's work and the food poverty movement as a springboard to try and solve some of the bigger drivers. Otherwise, to some extent, it does actually let politicians off the hook 
it implies you can solve this with 200 million to a holiday program, which is brilliant and I love it. Whereas actually we need them to spend billions on social housing and social security. We need them to bring forward the employment bill so people can get better jobs. These are things that are much more expensive and harder for them to do. And we need to find ways to put pressure on them to do the big hard things and not let them claim that because they funded this other thing, it's kind of box ticked, let's move on. That's the trick I think as a movement we need to be able to harness. Great to see so many of you chipping in with your ideas on our chat function. Paula Rappleton, such an important opportunity to break the cycle and create the next generation of healthy lifestyle parents. This is incredibly compelling. Uh, Mark is asking Greta, could please could add the social and ecological model that you mentioned to the chat. Are you able to do that, Greta, please? Does that make sense, what Mark said there? Uh, please, could you add the social and ecological model that you mentioned to the chat? Have you got that on a document or something, Greta? Um, I, may not, I may not be able to add it today, Mark, because I've, I've got it stored on my other drive and I don't have to switch my screen up, but I will definitely send it to Mark to distribute to everybody. Great stuff. Uh, Paul Paul is with us. Uh, I suspect like Hannah Hannah. We've got a bit of duplication there. We've tried to embed family cooking initiatives in some of our work. The children love engaging positively with their parents. Many parents lack knowledge and are afraid to ask for help, advice. In your presentation, Greta, there was actually as part of that half programs, the sort of uh, cookery lesson that the children were being given or maybe preparing their own food. I mean, I know that would be a, a, a small step, but kids going home and helping their parents and teaching their parents what to do with a with a cause yet i mean that could be part of the process as well although a small one okay so this year for half the dfb have uh, required um local authorities to have a uh, what i call cooking nutritional educational session within the half provision um and coincidentally we i've just got a new phd and postdoc in my lab that are actually researching just this part of half the evidence in terms of school suggests that in terms of children, it actually helps. So it actually helps them in their terms of their nutritional knowledge and helps in them in tasting and trying new foods, which may just be preparing a food. So it helps in um, the basic skills. It helps in widening their dietary intake. And it also helps in terms of understanding why it's important. There is far less evidence of what we what I call pester power with parents that actually that we, I think we're living in a bit of an ideological sense that somehow a child is going to you know chop up the zucchini or courgette at a holiday club and suddenly that it's going to go home and the parents going to suddenly start buying courgettes and the reason for this right so when I spoke to parents and we, we did some pilot work last year is that when and the holiday clubs provide a really good so for all of those people that are on this call that are delivering holiday clubs I, I really suggest that you do this and you actually allow children just to touch smell feel taste just taste put it onto their tongue new foods because when you speak to parents the issue is here is that their budgets are so tight they can't afford to buy food that may not be eaten or may not be liked by the family and so you know, a child going home saying to a parent, oh, yes, we should buy courgettes and we can do this. First of all, you have the issue that somehow the child has a skill set and knowledge that the parent doesn't have that can cause issues with that relationship. And the most, but the most important thing is the parent doesn't have the freedom in their budget, in the household budget, to actually risk buying a courgette and other members of the family not liking to eat it. And so holiday activities and food provide this opportunity to not only have children, but invite parents in in an afternoon to try things that their children have cooked, right? Because it's a low risk, great way of actually widening that culinary expertise for both parents and children. So don't be, don't, what I'm saying to hot holiday club, don't be worried if children taste a new fruit and they don't like it, it doesn't matter. They've tried it. We all know that a child has to try something about seven times to actually start to really get a taste for it. And so go ahead because, you know, hopefully with the funding, you can afford that wastage that parents won't be able to afford. Stacey Lynn says we worked with our school's catering department and food share provision 
we worked with our school's catering department and food share provision for food. Local supermarkets such as Tesco, etc., do food provision for activities as well, Phil Lewis, because Phil has said, I'm running a half program this summer, still need to organize the food, weighing up logistics of hot or cold lunch. Does anyone have any advice? Well, I was on the uh, Newcastle best summer ever webinar, I was involved with that, was it last week or the week before? But yeah, uh, deals being done with supermarkets, if you wanted something as a basic level, Phil might be one to look at. I think discounts were available for supermarkets on sandwich packets and stuff like that. Before you go, Andrew Forsey, because I know you've got to go off. Final thoughts for you of what we've been talking about over the last hour, please. Then I'll come to you, Helen, and I'll finish with you, Greta. I think two things, Mark, just to add to Greta's point, on the importance of holiday clubs as community assets. Yes, when it comes to food and trying new things and cooking things in the holidays, but a growing number of those clubs across the Feeding Britain network will double up in term time as a food club or pantry or social supermarket, an affordable food provider of sorts that stocks those fresh ingredients at a, an affordable rate at a reasonable price so that families can continue shopping there um, added to that, they then become sources of credit and savings uh, to sort of reinsert those shock absorbers into household budgets. Um, but secondly, in addition to that community self-help and these assets doubling up as holiday clubs and providers of affordable food and credit on a year round basis, and there have been some really important comments in the chat that spoke to our recent conversations with food banks, in particular across the old industrial heartlands and coalfield areas within the Feeding Britain network. Where people have said, Andrew, you know, there are some programs like this that really do make a difference and prevent at least some of the need for food banks in the here and now. But until we have that stable base of well paid manufacturing jobs, the food bank will be here for generation after generation. And so I do think this links into what Helen was saying around the need for an employment bill, both to protect the security of jobs at the bottom end of the labour market and ridding the labour market of some of the worst abuses of bogus self-employment, zero hours contracts and the like, but also to enshrine a legal target for full employment and to tie that to policies that bring job creation and investment into those coalfield areas and the industrial heartlands where, as I say, without that strong industrial base, hunger, food insecurity, whatever we call it, will be here for one generation after the next. So brilliant that we can enshrine that community self-help in here and now through these innovative models, but let's not lose sight of that bigger picture where we need those adequate jobs, wages, hours, and help from the social security system. Thanks, Andrew, enjoyed your company as always. Helen, would you like to give us your final thoughts, please? Yeah, I mean, the thing that's been going on in my mind is uh, I remember talking to uh, someone who is a, both a parent and a kind of activist. I remember them saying the thing you have to understand is the most important thing for my family and families like us about food at home is everyone has to get a full feeling. And actually the pursuit of that full feeling is the most important thing. Because if, if you know, if your kids are going away from the table still feeling hungry, then, you know, they're, they're not going to be happy. They're going to be tetchy. It's not, you know, as a parent, you want them to go away feeling full. full. And that really shapes your food choices because, as uh, I think Greta was saying, you have to guarantee everyone will eat it. And you, just, you have to eat a lot more fruit vegetables to feel full than you do carbohydrates. You know, a lot of potato can really help. You go away, you've got the full feeling. And you have to, as Greta said, make sure that everyone will eat it. So I have two kids. One is much more adventurous food wise. One is very picky and very nervous about food. The only way I can cook something new is if I say to my picky child, if you don't like it, it's fine. I will make you a sandwich after dinner. You won't go hungry. Now I have that luxury because I have enough food in the house. If I didn't have that margin, I would only ever cook five things because that's all I can guarantee everyone in my house will eat. So I think we have to understand that, you know, if you, if you take the full feeling for granted and you know you can top up, it gives you an immense freedom with food. If you can't take for granted the full feeling and you know you can't top up, you actually have to be pretty cautious because the consequences are so great if you get the meal wrong. You know, for me as a parent, if I send my kids to bed hungry, I, you know, I, I can't live with that. So I think that is the context in which people are operating. 
So we need to change the context so people do feel that bit of freedom around food. But you can't do that unless you deal with poverty. Mm. I don't listen. I don't think there's any doubt that all the finer nuances of all the nooks and crannies of the conversation, even we've had in the last hour and a quarter, are swathed in complexity like the ones you've just outlined on several levels there. Helen, lovely to meet you. Greta, final word from you, please. Okay, final word from me is, I think that we've all gone through a really difficult year and a bit with COVID. I think that everyone has had a different experience of COVID. It's really hit some of our underserved families really hard. So, so my kind of like is a bit of a cheery leading note to end on and say, Come on, let's go and make half the best ever because, my goodness, I know so many families that are just looking forward for their children to be able to do some physical activity and have some fun and see their friends. And if we go to a lockdown or something awful happens, let's be resilient, innovative, and still make half the best ever and just deliver in a slightly different way. So yeah. thank you so much. No, thank you very much. And I think that's a really nice place to, to finish because, again, to mention something I was involved with uh, for Street Games last week, which was, was the Newcastle Best Summer Ever programme. Some of the stories, the success stories, the joy that had emanated out, the inspirational young people that have maybe uh, been involved for a couple of years and then been able to go off and get involved themselves and run their own programs. It was just so inspiring to listen to. Thanks to you, Greta. Very nice to meet you as well. Listen, uh, thanks for being with us for this, this plenary session, kickoff week two. Uh, I hope you've taken some bits and pieces out of there. It, uh, Obviously, and, and actually, I must thank you all because the, the chat area has been going absolutely bananas, whipping past me as I'm trying to read one, something else is coming in. So if you got lost in the gaps, then I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm sure you're all enterprising enough to find each other. If, if Greta or Helen or Andrew have inspired you and you want to pick up on something with them, I'm sure you're all enterprising enough to find each other or maybe go via street games and they'll try and connect you complex subject, harrowing subject in many respects. I cannot believe in 2021 we are dealing with some families in such and children in such terrible situations. But good luck to all of you in trying to do your bit to overcome. Let's keep fighting, everybody. Thanks for being with us. I'm Mark Clements. Hope you have a lovely day. And as I say, thanks for being with us for this plenary session at the start of week two of the 2021 Street Games Conference. Goodbye from me, everybody.